have been given many stories from the Bible about the relationship between Abraham and Sarah. By chapter 24 of Genesis, we begin to move on with the next generation and see the formation of a new couple, that which is Abraham's son Isaac and Rebekah. But it would appear that Isaac and Rebekah's meeting was much less down to chance and instead somewhat orchestrated by Abraham, who some might say might have been getting impatient that Isaac hadn't gone and found himself a woman yet. The Bible tells us in the beginning of this chapter that Abraham was now very old, but that despite his old age, he had been blessed by God in every way, indicating that despite losing Sarah, he had managed to find some peace and closure in her absence. He turns to his senior servant in the household and tells him, Put your hand under my thigh. I want you to swear by the Lord, the God of heaven and the God of earth, that you will not get a wife for my son from the daughters of the Canaanites, among whom I am living, but will go to my country and my own relatives and get a wife for my son Isaac. The Bible tells us that this servant was the oldest servant of the household, and some have theorized that this was Eliza, he who was mentioned in chapter 15, as being the one to inherit Abraham's estate when Abraham was worried that he would die without children. But for the duration of this chapter, the servant goes unnamed, and so it is hard to determine his actual identity. What we do know is that he is asked to place his hand beneath the thigh of Abraham, before being made to swear that he would not find a wife for Isaac amongst the Canaanites, but will instead go to Abraham's original country in Chaldea to find one instead. Going by some ancient customs, the placing of one's hand under the thigh of their master was thought to have been a pretty big deal, something along the lines of a modern day pinky promise. It indicated that an important oath was being made and thus reveals how serious Abraham was in securing a wife for Isaac that wasn't a Canaanite. He goes as far as to make his servant swear by God that this will not happen and that his wife will have originated from Chaldea, and so being one of their own tribe, so to speak. But the servant does question Abraham, asking, what if the woman is unwilling to come back with me to this land? Shall I then take your son back to the country you came from? To which Abraham replies, make sure that you do not take my son back there. The Lord, the God of heaven, who brought me out of my father's household and my native land, and who spoke to me and promised me an oath, saying, To your offspring I will give this land, he will send his angel before you, so that you can get a wife for my son from there. If the woman is unwilling to come back with you, then you will be released from this oath of mine. Only do not take my son back there. These seem like pretty straightforward instructions, though it does raise the question as to why Abraham did not want Isaac to return to his homeland to find a wife for himself. We know why he didn't want him taking a Canaanite bride, because they not only worshipped a different god, but they might have also corrupted Isaac, at least in Abraham's eyes. But the reason for not wanting him to venture out for himself in search of the one does seem a bit odd. Some have explained this idea that Isaac was a product of the covenant between Abraham and God, and thus was the result of a promise made by God to Abraham. This not only made him special, but it also made him the inheritor of the promised land of Canaan. If Isaac was to leave the land in search of a wife, Abraham seems to believe that the promise would be compromised for the land of Canaan would be absent of its true ruler. But furthermore, there is also an idea that due to the importance of Isaac, a woman should have come to him as opposed to him chasing one. 
We see the servant agree to the task set before him, and he is seen to leave Abraham's house with 10 camels loaded with gifts. He sets out to the region of Aram Naharim and finds himself amongst the town of Nahor. There he stops at the well outside of the town and spots the women of the town emerging to draw the water. Upon seeing these women, the servant prays to God, saying, Lord, the God of my master Abraham, make me successful today and show kindness to my master Abraham. See, I am standing beside this spring and the daughters of the townspeople are coming out to draw water. May it be that when I say to a young woman, please let down your jar, that I may have a drink, and she says, drink, and I'll water your camels too, let her be the one you have chosen for your servant Isaac. By this, I will know that you have shown kindness to my master. We see the servant seek counsel from God, showing believers that anyone, not just the one such as Abraham, has the ability to commune with the Lord. The servant is wise to do this, for other than Abraham's instructions, he did not have any real strategy on how to go about securing a wife for Isaac. But furthermore, he also asks God to identify the woman by her generosity and kindness, for whichever woman offers to feed the camels would surely be the one. The servant proves to be quite shrewd here, and certainly has Abraham and Isaac's best interests at heart, for he doesn't want to just pick any woman in an effort to get this quest over with, but wants one who is humble and caring enough to feed the camels, ten of them to be precise. It can also be said that the servant did not come to Nahor looking for a woman of beauty, but instead a woman of character, one who he believed would be good for and to Isaac, and not just one who was easy on the eyes. Yet the Bible tells us that before he's even finished praying, Rebekah emerges with a water jar. The Bible tells us that she was the daughter of Bethel, the son of Milcah, who was the wife of Abraham's brother Nahor. She was described as being very beautiful and pure, in that no man had ever slept with her. It's interesting that she catches the servant's eye before he's even finished his prayer, which some might say was God speeding up the process and nudging the servant in the right direction. It can also be said that if God knows one's heart and intentions to be pure, he does not require total submission in the form of prayer and instead can reward someone simply for the virtue of their character. So the servant rushed over to introduce himself and asked for some water from her jar. Drink, my lord, Rebecca told him, and she gave him water for him to drink. Once she had given him a drink, she told him, I'll draw water for your camels too, until they have had enough to drink. And so, she quickly emptied her jar into the trowel, ran back to the well to draw more water, and drew enough for all of the servant's camels. Now without saying a word, the servant watched her closely, as he tried to determine whether or not this woman was indeed the one. She certainly fit the criteria, in terms of being generous and humble, and certainly coincided with the idea of a righteous woman that the servant had conveyed before God. She not only offered him water, but went back and forth to feed the camels too. Now it might not seem like that big of a deal, but given how much water camels drink, and given that there were 10 of them, it's quite remarkable that Rebecca offered to do this at all. This is perhaps why the servant watches her so intently as she performs this task not just because he is amazed by her, but also because he wanted to make sure that she was a woman of her word. Once Rebecca had finished feeding the camels, the servant took out a nose ring and two golden bracelets, for which we can presume he offered to her as payment for her service, but also because it showed 
that he came from a master who was very wealthy. He inquires as to who her family was, and was probably rejoiced to learn that she was related to Abraham's family, and thus would make an ideal match for Isaac, given that Abraham wanted to, well, keep it all in the family. The servant asks for succor at Rebekah's house, which is granted, and we also see the servant proceed to praise God for having led him to that which was sought after. The Bible tells us that Rebekah ran home to tell her mother of the things she had earned that day, suggesting her excitement at having met the servant and the gifts he had bestowed her with. We also learn that Rebekah had a brother named Laban, and that when Laban saw the trinkets his sister had earned, and saw the servant standing beside her, he immediately knew that he had been sent by the Lord, for he tells him, Come, you who are blessed by the Lord, why are you standing out here? I have prepared the house and a place for the camels. The camels were unloaded, and the servant was treated to having his feet washed, as well as being served a meal. But he would not eat anything until he had spoken to Rebecca's family about his proposition. So with that, he proceeds to explain to them exactly why he has come, who his master is, the oath that he had sworn, and why Rebecca fit the bill. After having heard everything the servant had to say, both Laban and Rebecca's father Bethel say in tandem that there is nothing they can say or do to deny the servant of his request, for he has come from God. With that, they are very quick to offer up Rebecca and tell the servant, Here is Rebecca, take her and go, and let her become the wife of your master's son, as the Lord has directed. Yet again, the servant bows to the ground before the Lord, before producing more articles of gold, silver, and clothing to give to Rebecca. He also distributed this wealth to Rebecca's family as well, perhaps as compensation for, in effect, stealing away their daughter and ferrying her off to a man that none of them actually knew. But relinquishing Rebecca is harder than her family had anticipated, for when it comes to handing her over, it is her mother and brother who request, let the young woman remain with us for ten days or so, then you may go. But the servant is adamant and tells them, do not detain me, now that the Lord has granted me success to my journey, send me on my way so I may go to my master. Evidently, the servant did not want to delay his mission any more than he needed to, and saw the fulfillment of his obligation to Abraham as an absolute priority. This may have been because he knew Abraham's time was near, and he wanted Abraham to see this quest fulfilled, and to see his son married before he passed away. It might also be said that the servant did not want to delay God's will either, for God had been prompt in giving him a sign that Rebecca was the one. Therefore, he felt obligated to the Lord to complete the quest as soon as possible. Yet despite this, Rebecca's family still argue for the extra 10 days, and call for Rebecca to decide, asking, will you go with this man? And to their disappointment, Rebecca bravely tells them, I will go. It can be said that this was pretty bold of Rebecca, and that her willingness to leave behind her home, and virtually everything she had ever known, is pretty courageous. She had no idea that the servant was who he said he was, nor what type of man Isaac would be when she met him. Yet it is suggested that she put her faith in God, and God saw her delivered safely because of it. Whilst it was likely painful for Rebecca to be so direct and decisive with her words, I will go, it shows us that she recognised her loyalty was to God first, and not her family, and that if this was God's will, she had to follow his commands. With this, her family has no choice but to send her on her way with the servant, 
though they do give her their blessing, saying, Our sister, may you increase to thousands upon thousands, may your offspring possess the cities of their enemies. Then Rebecca, along with her own attendants, ready themselves, and start to make their journey to their new home, along with the servant. It is here we see Isaac again, and we are told that he had come out into the field one evening to meditate. When he looked up, he saw camels approaching, and realized that these were his father's camels, and probably recognized the servant too. Interestingly, it's unclear if Isaac was privy to the arrangement made by his father, and so he may not have been too moved by anything other than curiosity at the approaching camels. On the other hand, if he was aware of his father's arrangement, then he would likely have been anxious, excited, and probably dying of anticipation to see who his wife would be, or whether the servant had even found anyone for him. It is here that Rebecca and Isaac make eye contact, and she inquires to the servant as to who he is. He is my master, the servant answered. With that, Rebecca realizes that this is her husband-to-be, and so she takes her veil and covers herself in an effort to maintain some modesty. It can be said that this was a sign of her chastity, purity, and also a form of respect, an effort by her to impress Isaac and put her best foot forward in showing him that she was an honest woman. The Bible cuts out the awkward introductions and details of the love affair, and simply tells us that Isaac brought her into the tent of his mother Sarah, and he married Rebekah, evidently quite pleased with the work of the servant in finding him such a woman. She became his wife, and he loved her, and in Rebecca, Isaac was comforted after the death of his mother. Let me know what you thought about today's episode in the comments below, and as always, if you've enjoyed today's episode, then don't forget to give it a thumbs up, and don't forget to subscribe for more content just like this. Until next time.